Hey there, welcome back or welcome if you're new here. My name is Maria and I like to make technology videos on the internet. And this video is my second book club video where we talk about books relating to technology or to personal development. And this month's book is called The Pragmatic Programmer by Andrew Hunt and David Thomas, who are both very prominent figures in the world of software development. And what this book is essentially about, it's following the major pitfalls and the best practices that software developers can go through in their careers and like writing code, developing documents, that kind of stuff. So there are eight sections in this and I thought it would be interesting to talk about the main ideas that I learned. And it's very interesting because you can go to this book and read it like when you're young like I am, or you can read it when you're already in your career for a long time and you'll get different things out of it. So I thought it would be interesting to make a video now when I'm at the beginning of my career and I've experienced some of these things but not everything. So you can see maybe in a few years time how different my perspective is or the different perspectives that other people who have more experience in software development have than I do. So we'll talk about the main ideas in this and let's get started. So as this book is called The Pragmatic Programmer, what does it actually mean to be a pragmatic programmer? Well, it essentially means that you are fast at adapting to things, like different changes in the world of software engineering, and you are an early adopter of many new technologies. Then you also have the following character traits, which are that you're a critical thinker, you're inquisitive, so you're also realistic to what can actually be done or produced within a certain amount of time. And you're also a jack of all trades. So you know a little bit of everything at least so that you understand what's going on in the entire system and not just a specific section. Another thing that makes this book unique is that it includes tips. In the beginning of this book, there are two first tips are that you should care about your craft and that you should think about your what you're working on and your work. One of the really cool quotes that they have, like every section almost starts with a quotation. One of their first ones is, we who cut mere stones must be envisioning cathedrals. Even though they're just doing a, working on something small, they're envisioning what it can actually look like. And that's the same thing when you write software. Another interesting thing that they relate to being a pragmatic programmer is the Japanese word kaizen, which means that you're always making small improvements and that you're always trying your best every day to add tools to your toolbox. So the first chapter in this book is called The Pragmatic Philosophy. And there are two main points that they want to talk about, which one is that you should never think in a small context. You should not just think about the immediate problem that you have. You should always be thinking in the larger context of your code base or of the problem you're solving and think in a bigger picture. And the second philosophy is that you should take responsibility for everything you do, whether it's writing code or writing documentation and not neglect doing those things. What's very interesting is that each chapter is broken down into smaller subsections, which have very funny names. Like the first one is literally called the cat ate my source code. So in that section, they're essentially saying again, like take responsibility for yourself and your actions, because in, especially in terms of your career development, because no one is going to just be like, oh, you did good work, you deserve a promotion. You need to actually fight for yourself and develop your own career. No one's going to tell you like, oh, here, this is what you should study. This is what you should do. You need to be a constant self-learner and don't be afraid to admit ignorance or error when you're learning something new. Then in the second section is called software entropy and entropy in physics basically means disorder. But in the software development world, what it means is software rot. So it means you should not live with broken windows in your code, which mean bad designs or wrong decisions or just like bad code, essentially, like maybe it's has a horrible runtime or something. Then in the third section, it's called Stone Soup and Boiled Frogs, which talks about how you should work out what you can reason reasonably ask for, develop that thing, and then say it would be better if we added other things. So it's like, make the MVP and then add to it. Don't just make everything at once because there's no such thing as perfect software. The fourth section is called Good Enough Software, which continues on the same idea, which is like, you should write software that's good enough for your users, future maintainers who are going to like enter your code base and for your own peace of mind. The main idea is that great software today is often preferable and better than perfect software tomorrow. So just create what's right for now and then you can edit it and add things to it later on. That's why they have like 
when you're working on a like a product, you have like an alpha version, a beta version, V1, that kind of stuff. And the fifth section is actually one of my favorites. It's called your knowledge portfolio. They quote Benjamin Franklin, who says your investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. They say that a knowledge portfolio is similar to an investment portfolio. What they mean is that serious investors invest regularly as a habit. That's what you should be doing as a software developer as well. You should be investing in your knowledge just as a habit. You should always be learning new things. The second thing is that diversification is key to long-term success. So try learning different things because what if one of those things ends up not being useful in a few years? Smart investors balance their portfolios between conservative and high-risk, high-reward investments. So say we know that, okay, learning Java, for instance, is not the highest reward thing, but it's a good thing to learn. It's a conservative thing to learn, but something high risk would be learning the programming language like Rust, which not a lot of companies might use, but it might be a high reward in the future. The other thing they say is that investors try to buy low and sell high for a max return value, and that portfolios should be reviewed and rebalanced periodically. So it's always like review the things you know and try to see where do you have gaps and where can you learn more and fill in that knowledge and build your knowledge portfolio. Section seven is called the evils of duplication. So things essentially change a lot of the time in programming and code and they cause instability. Programmers are constantly in maintenance mode and our understanding of different things, requirements changes every day. A piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous authoritative representation in a system. So that means dry so don't repeat yourself don't have multiple copies of something and that might happen because you might have been imposed to duplicate something so you had no choice it might have been inadvertent so you didn't realize that someone else had already written this thing then you might have gotten impatient so you got lazy and just did it and you it might have been inter-developer so it's like yeah multiple people duplicated a piece of code which might have not known about it might have known about it section eight is called orthogonality which is a term borrowed from geometry, which means when two lines meet at a right angle and they're independent of one another. So it's essentially saying that in software, we should uh, decouple things. So make it modular, component-based, layered. So one thing does not affect another, like changing the database does not affect the UI. Section nine is called reversibility. So you don't want to narrow a project down so much that Anything like literally a butterfly flapping its wings in Tokyo is gonna like crumble your project and change it so much. So keep things more like abstract and let the programmers make the decisions. Like when you're writing documentation, don't just like write out every single thing you're gonna do. No, just leave it abstract and then figure out the rest after you explored writing the code. So decisions essentially should not be cast in stone and there should be no final decisions is one of the tips they give. Chapter 10 is tracer bullets, which is actually something I kind of couldn't understand that much, but it's essentially exploring how to create your code and it's not like you're writing throwaway code like you're actually building essentially an architectural skeleton in which your developers can hang code onto it so you're trying to build something it's not prototyping because chapter or section 11 is called prototyping and post-it notes where it talks about how you essentially like think about what you're trying to do and you prototype it but you're writing like more throwaway code like you're just trying things okay this didn't work but whereas Tracer Bullet is more like you're trying to explore something, but you're actually going to use this code in the future. Sections 12 was domain languages and 13 is estimating. So it's like estimate things so that you avoid surprises, like trying to estimate how long things are going to take. Okay, so chapter three is called the basic tools. And I think it's one of my favorite chapters, actually. And what it's essentially is about is that everyone starts off with their own basic set of tools and the skills that they have. Each tool will have a personality of its own, its own quirks, and you can sharpen it over time. Sometimes it'll wear out, so you'll have to like work on that. And they become extensions of your hand. So they use a lot of like woodworking analogies. And I really like how they do provide many stories in this book to help you visualize things in a different way. Basically, they're saying that tools amplify your talent. The better your tools are, the better you and the better you know how to use them the more productive you can be and essentially what they're talking about is a lot of things like text editors like which ides do you use and they're saying that you should not make a mistake in staying in one specific ide for your entire career they say that you should uh, leave its cozy interface and try something new and see what you can find because a lot of the time there are limits imposed by an integrated development environment and you should invest in your own basic toolbox so what they're saying in section 14, which is called the power of plain text, is that 
As programmers, our base material is not wood or iron, it is knowledge, and that the best format for storing knowledge is in plain text. Why is that the case? Well, plain text essentially means printable characters that are readable by people. So essentially, instead of storing something as 001100, let's store it as like my variable x equals whatever. So it's like we can read it and understand it. So if we see this plain text, we can understand what's going on. That's why like, even databases are stored in plain text. It's essentially a sh insurance against obsolescence. So it's like, what if you don't know what this program is doing? Okay, we found the plain text. We can read it and understand what it means. It provides leverage because virtually every tool in the computing universe, like compilers, editors, source code, it's all able to operate in plain text and it's easier to test this kind of stuff. So section 15 is called shell games and it's saying that every woodworker needs a good workbench. And for programmers, this workbench is the command shell. <laughs> and they're saying that uh, GUI interfaces are wonderful, but you're essentially, like again, I said, missing out on some of the things that they haven't implemented because you're not getting the full capabilities of your environment. So you can't combine common tasks, tasks like you making macros to do a few things in your GUI environments. So it's better to just work in the shell like straight away. Section 16 is called power editing which says that you should use a single editor well. So not just like, just use a single editor, but use specifically one very well. The features sh that it should have is that it should be configurable. So you can change fonts, colors, like keystroke bindings, and it should be extensible. So it shouldn't become obsolete soon. Like it should continue to be used for many years and it should be programmable. So they give examples like using Vim or Emacs, which I'm gonna try learning soon. I'm gonna try learning Vim. So it's gonna be very interesting. I'll take a video of me trying to learn. They were saying like, oh yeah, section 17, source code source code control. Definitely, it's like the giant undo key for code, but I thought it was a funny way of saying it. Yeah, definitely keep your thing in like a git. 18 was debugging. So embrace the fact that debugging is just problem solving and attack it as such. I know debugging is annoying and that it can make you panic, especially if you're on a tight deadline. But it's like, they're saying don't panic. Just focus on it and just be positive. Have a more positive mindset about it. 19 was text manipulation and section 20 was called code generators. So it's like, yeah, use templates to save you time. And yeah, this chapter was interesting. And it's like, I think it's my time in my career to start building my toolbox. So learning Vim and trying to use all of these commands instead of just using like VS code and stuff like that. Okay, chapter four is called pragmatic paranoia. It's essentially saying that you should not be writing perfect code. There's no such thing as perfect software and pragmatic programmers do not trust other people's code or their code either. So code in defense of your own mistakes, essentially. Section 21 is called design by contract. They talk about how a contract defines your rights and responsibilities as well as those of the other party. So in terms of software, there is this programming language called Eiffel, which I have to learn not this semester, but next semester, so sad, in my software design course. And it focuses on documenting and agreeing to the rights and responsibilities of software modules and to ensure program correctness. What is a correct program? It is one that does no more and no less than what it says it does. The main ideas in that are that you have preconditions, which are requirements to be called, post conditions, which is what is guaranteed to be returned, and class invariants, which are essentially the class ensures that this condition is true. And yeah, that's what happens. So I'll be learning more about that very soon. Then chapter 22 or section 22, I keep making that mistake. It's dead programs tell no lies. Crash early when you're writing code and throw errors and exceptions. But chapter 20, uh, section 23, assertive programming says that you should add code to check things even if you think that it could never happen. So the impossible could be possible, you never know. Section 24 is when do you actually use exceptions? So use exceptions for the exceptional problems and reserve for unexpected events. So you don't wanna just throw an exception, you wanna maybe catch those errors, do error handling when you can use that as an alternative. Don't just throw an error and like crash the entire program. Er handle the error, like if someone enters the password wrong, don't just crash the program, be like, hey, you entered the password wrong, try again stuff like that. Section 25 is how to balance resources because the resources you might be using are memory, transactions, threads, files. There should be a pattern in place. So you allocate that resource that you're using, you use it and then deallocate it. And all of those things should be done in that single routine or object that is allocating that stuff. So the tip that they give is finish what you start. So we can move on to chapter five, which is called bend or break. 
In chapter 5, it talks about writing flexible code so that it doesn't get outdated very quickly. Section 26 is called decoupling and the law of Demeter. So they say that you should write shy code, which means that there are two ways. So organize your code into cells or modules and limit the interaction between those. So if one module gets compromised, then it can be replaced and the other modules will just carry on like normal. So it's similar to how spies work. So if one spy is compromised, then they don't have any information that can lead them to the other spies. So that's an interesting analogy for that that they gave. Section 27 is called metaprogramming. That means making your code very highly configurable and soft, so very easy to adapt to changes. And metadata is any data that describes the application, so how it should run, what resources it should use, and other things like that. So an example of that is when you're in your web browser and you save a preference that you don't want to see the toolbar. So it saves that in an internal database as metadata. So their tip is that you should put abstractions in code and details in the metadata. Section 28 is called temporal coupling. So it's all about time, an often ignored aspect of software architecture. Two important aspects that they talk about are concurrency, which is when things happen at the same time, like multiple different things, and then ordering, so the relative position of something happening in time. And they say that you should always design for concurrency, so always design for many things happening at the same time. Then section 29 is called it's just a view, and they talk about how how do objects essentially run with within each other, like everything running at runtime? Well, since they're in different modules, how does that happen? They explain how events work, and an event is essentially a special message saying that something interesting just happened, and different modules and parts of the code can subscribe to different events. And this is essentially explaining how the web works, because you can yeah, so signal, like an event signals for something else to happen. And they talked about MVC architecture, so models, views, and controllers. They see that a model is the data itself with common operations to manipulate it. A view is what the data displays, so you, like a graph on the screen or something like that. And the controller is that like each view has its own controller, and like a graph can zoom in and out. And a controller does not affect the data itself, just that view, so it doesn't affect the models. Section 31 is called Programming by Coincidence. And they say that you should avoid relying on luck and accidental success when you're coding and be more in favor of programming deliberately. How can you do this? Well, you can proceed from a plan. You can document your assumptions and test those assumptions. And you should not be a slave to history. Like, don't just look at the code and be like, oh, yeah, everybody did this, so I can do it too. No, maybe it's not a good thing anymore. Maybe they coded it a year ago and now it's not the best practice. Challenge those assumptions. Section 32 is called algorithm speed, which a lot of students can probably relate to, learning big O notation. That's basically what they talk about, like approximating the worst case time of things. And that most significant algorithms are not linear. The good news is most of them are sublinear, but a lot of them might be above linear time complexity. So you have to make sure that you're not writing horribly slow algorithms in your programs. Section 33 is about refactoring. And it's like, yeah, code needs to evolve. It's not just a static thing that stays in place. And it's more like gardening than construction. So you always have to like, you, you don't just build something and then you're done. It's gardening. You're always like picking away and stuff, taking out the weeds, stuff like that. So you're always continuously maintaining it. And they say that you should refactor early and refactor often. I've seen this in my own experience. If you don't refactor often, and very early, then you get into this whole mess of like, oh my god, how can we do this? Now I have to make an entire project to refactor this entire section, which is really annoying. And section 34 is that code that's easy to test. So unit test each of your modules to verify its behavior and test against contract. So you could also use test-driven development, which is when you write the test first and then write the code, which is very interesting and a different way of thinking, which would be interesting for you to try if you have never done that before. Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, I'm just going to group together. They're called Before the Project and Pragmatic Projects. So the I didn't really learn that much about it because it was mostly just like, oh yeah, the projects that you've been doing on your own or like all the skills that I was talking about before, they were talking about before, is transferable to working with other people. So they were saying that they're in Section 36, they talk about the requirements pit, which is essentially that requirements rarely lie on the surface of something and you have to dig to get beneath them. And I know running with like trying to champion my own projects, but that is definitely the case. You have to find the requirements by digging deep underneath the surface. And there are definitely, definitely many layers of assumptions, misconceptions, and politics, 
in this kind of stuff. Yeah, you should make your requirements in general and then let the developers actually do the implementation. So when you're writing your design docs, make it very general and then start trying to implement it later on and work with your users, of course. So section 38, I think is probably important. It's called not until you're ready. So listen to nagging doubts that you have and start whenever you're ready. So don't start the project until you feel ready and that you have all these requirements in place. And yeah, that was all, all the sections of this book. I hope you learned a lot. I definitely did from reading this book. It took me a while actually, because I would just like read it, put it down, read it later. I wasn't like, I wasn't being pragmatic about reading it, you know? I actually realized that I've read two other books by these guys because they have written many textbooks and I've read one about Ruby and one about Ruby on Rails in my past. And it's interesting because uh, Dave Thomas, he also has this website called Code Kata and I try to do katas from there, which is like programming exercises and they're pretty interesting. So I recommend that you check out this book or other books by these authors. And it was a really interesting read. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot of different things and it has pushed me to try to do things in a different way and think differently. So I hope that you've learned something new today and leave your uh, some information in the comments about what you learned or what you think about some of these tips or ideas. And I'll see you next time. Bye.